Welcome everyone to our Global Read brought to you by the Charter for Compassion's Education Institute. We're really uh, fortunate to have with us Diane Kalin Sukra, who will be discussing her book, Save Your City. I'd like to just make a couple of announcements. First, we wanna thank everyone who made this Global Read possible with your generous donations and to the Public Sector Digest for helping promote this Global Read. Also, uh, just to announce our upcoming Global Read for March, which is The Inner Self by Hugh Mackay. He'll be with us. And in March, we're gonna have, our Turner Education Institute is going to be hosting a course called Humanity 360, Environmental Concerns That Affect Us All, beginning on March 15th. It's a four week online course. And also just to announce the April course, because it's uh, a lot of people like to sign up for this one for is poetry for inspiration and well-being. It'll begin on April 6th, and it is a five-week online course. So hope you can join us for that. And uh, right now, I just want to introduce our, our host for uh, tonight's program, or whatever time it is <laughs> where you're coming from, uh, Lisa Berkeley. Thanks for being here with us today. Uh, Lisa is the founder and director of the Institute for Inner Economy, a nonpartisan think tank dedicated to operationalizing positive peace for governance, diplomacy, and civil progress at the local, national, and international level. Her work as a peace facilitator, activist, and municipal leader has spanned across three continents and stems from more than 25 years of experience in alternative and holistic medicine and education, stress management, and interpersonal conflict resolution. Her work has been publicly recognized across the globe. Dr. Berkeley's current focus is on helping small to mid-sized cities adopt holistic city frameworks in order to be in alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. She is an elected city council member in her home city of Marina, California, where she serves on a number of boards, including Women in International Securities, U.S. West Coast Chapter, the Housing Resource Center of Monterey County, and the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, where she is the representative on the California Association of Councils of Governments. Dr. Berkeley also serves on the Advisory Council for Compassionate California, is the lead for Compassionate Monterey County, and is the co-lead for the Charter for Compassion's Peace Sector. Thanks, Lisa, for being here with us. And before I totally turn it over to you, I forgot, I wanted to remind everyone that's here with us today to please use the chat room to ask, ask any questions that you might have of our guest um, today. Um, so Lisa, will you take it from here, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, and I'm just gonna, okay, there we go. Um, and just, I don't know if it was mentioned before, this, this session is being recorded and you can use the chat and some people are more comfortable with the Q&A box who are watching live, so feel free to use that. So I am so excited and happy to be here because I feel like I have met a, a colleague on the path of really a huge commitment to making the world a better place city by city. And so um, it's with my great pleasure that I uh, am about to share a conversation with Diane Kalen Sukra, who is an author and keynote speaker and community builder. She was born with the gift of encouragement and desire for everyone to thrive and to meet their potential. Her core belief is that as social beings, we flourish in healthy, sustainable communities where good governance, servant leadership, and compassionate culture support the well being of all. Over the past 25 years, this inspiration has taken Diane to countless communities and leadership roles from a CBC television producer, documentary maker, community organizer, to multi-award winning municipal chief administrator office, excuse me, chief administrative officer. She is an expert advisor to municipalities and organizations, educator, certified culture transformation consultant with Barrett Value Center and certified compassionate integrity facility facilitator with Life University's Center for Compassion, Integrity, and Secular Ethics. She is also a media commentator and widely published writer. Look for Diane's regular civic resilience column in Public Sector Digest, which maybe Diane can tell us a little bit more of which um, 
what what publication that is and then you can we can hear more about that and then also if you want to learn more about diane or her work go to save your city that's written as one word s-a-v-e-y-o-u-r city c-i-t-y dot c-a diane what a pleasure to have you here with us thank you for being here thank you dr berkeley great fan of yours good to see you mm, thank you and uh, we can, for, for we can uh, go into a casual space. So please feel free to call me Lisa. So there's so much to um, to jump into here. Um, and in preparation for this conversation, I came across this video that is uh, from Cheshire, England, and it is indicative of a very toxic leadership. And so I'd like to start off with sharing this, um, this clip with you and with the community. And for those of you who are watching this, I invite you to, to think, are these the kind of leaders that you want running your, your town, your city, your community? And really just listen from that perspective. And uh, I'm going to jump into the video. Oops, hold on one second. And let's go to share. One more second. Okay. Is everyone seeing the YouTube video? Okay, terrific. Hello again. Hello again. I thought I wasn't going to get in then. <laughs> when do we plan to start? Oh, I think we could start any moment, Chairman. Um, I think it's perhaps helpful just to go through the same things as we went through before, which is just to encourage people to switch off their microphones, um, because it does reduce the background. Can we be assured that we won't be thrown out of the meeting like we were last time? Um, I, as long as we have reasonable behaviour from everyone, no one would be excluded from the meeting. I, I, was, I was thrown out of the meeting. Uh, so it was quite right. So was Councillor Roberton. Oh, please let the chairman this is weird, speak. Please. If you disrupt this meeting, I will have to remove you from it. You can't. It's only the chairman who can remove people from a meeting. You have no authority here, Jackie Weaver. No authority at all. She's just kicked him out. Don't, don't. She's kicked him out. Don't. This is a meeting called by two councillors. Illegally. They now elect a chairman. No, they can't because the vice chair's here. I take charge. Uh, Read the standing orders. Read them. And Hello again. Hello again. I thought, whoops. And then it, it goes back to the beginning. I think that, I'm not sure, did it cut us off a little bit? I think maybe it did, but you have a gist of what it is as far as just incredibly toxic behavior within the zoom space that so many of us have had to go to as a result of of covid um and you know just I, i've watched that and as a council person i'm just mortified by this and so i know this is kind of the theme for what brought you to write your book but can you share with us more about what brought you to write it how did you get here and why did you write the book Actually, Lisa, your your clip is timely, and uh, you know, really, it, it it exactly captures why I wrote the book. In fact, the book begins with uh, the chapter called uh, "Welcome to Bullyville: um, Entering the City Gates," and it actually features another municipality, this one in Canada, um, where a very similar dysfunctional, toxic type of um, conduct is happening at um, at the civic leadership level, and. I don't know. I mean, this just went viral in the. I, I didn't haven't studied their standing orders or uh, what the particulars were there of the debate from. But from what I understand is that the meeting took place quite some time ago, and uh, just went viral because people are shocked that that's actually what's taking place, and um, that same shock happened for me quite some time ago, and uh, and I felt the need to actually say something about it to identify it because. Local governments don't exist in isolation of their communities. They're a reflection of the community. And traditionally, like historically, civic leaders are supposed to be the, um, you know, the culture shapers of society. It's the essence of civic leadership to foster the kind of uh, culture, to set an example, to, to be the salt of the earth uh, in communities. And, 
it was incredibly disturbing. And for me, the reason why I think I was able to see it um, so long ago was because of the nature of my work, like as a community building, when you're in that local or when you're in, when you're in that community or when you're facing that on a council, you think it's just you, it's, it's part of our human nature. We think it's just, it's just Jackie Weaver or it's just you know, um, my particular mayor or my particular community. But, and that would, that it could sometimes be the case where it's an isolated incident of a few personalities. But when we see, you know, incivility rising all through society on multitudinous levels from, from in the schools to in the public square, to the way in which the public is treating uh, leaders, to, to the way in which leaders are, you know, sort of leaders are treating the public, the, the level of discourse uh, that we see um, on social media and whatnot, it it's points to a much deeper problem. And it's a problem that, um, people were not prepared to address. Like at the time I was a, a you know, city manager is what people would recognize that term more than CAO. And um, the typical governance tools when you're facing these kind of challenges, um, you would probably be very familiar with these, um, Lisa, are wholly inadequate to deal with those kind of problems. So if you were a local government facing that, somebody would come in and say, okay, um, you know, let's do a governance review uh, and find out who's right, who's wrong. Maybe you bring an investigator, uh, maybe someone is uh, reprimanded or something for a little while. Those are new powers that local governments have been handed um, in order to deal with this kind of stuff. But even a code of conduct, which is important, um, or in the States, they often call them civility codes. They're not gonna solve the much deeper problem, which is kind of a heart problem. It's kind of a cultural problem. And, and while, while everyone was telling me you can't do anything about it, I know very well that uh, cultural leadership has been a staple of political leadership since, since we've had governance structures. And so I wanted to raise the alarm on this and uh, talk about this as a, as a culture risk. Mm -hmm. So let's get clear also on, on the term culture. What does culture mean for you in this context? Well, culture is essentially values expressed in behavior. That, that's what becomes your culture. I look at values like planting seeds in a, in a forest that grow branches that become the behaviors. Then you have a cultural forest. Either it's vibrant and green and sustainable, or it's like dark and dry and infertile and, and, and not growing, right? And I began to see that this type of uh, difficult culture is the greatest impediment that we face to all the challenges, all of our aspirations, all the things that we put in our strategic directions document, all the things that the public says that they want in their long-term official planning. Like how are you gonna build a sustainable community when you can't even hold a meeting and make effective decisions? Or even, you know, um, how, how, well, how are we gonna sustain our democracy? Like that's like the politics of the snake pit. I mean, which, how are we gonna have inclusive communities what, what young woman is gonna to wanna to run? What person of color, what LGBTQ person is gonna to wanna to inject themselves into that kind of situation? And, and furthermore, it's a huge problem for good governance. And then as we go into these turbulent times where we all know that resilience is kind of a key factor for all of us thriving and moving forward together, we know that resilience requires social unity and trust. And there's nothing like this kind of dysfunction to destroy all meaningful trust, which we see all the indicators globally are showing declining levels of trust. And so it became like, to me, imperative that we stop and actually fully address culture and um, recognize that our political and social economic system is undergirded by a culture. And we are threatening that very system by the culture that we are allowing to foster and generate. Yeah, for sure. It's so interesting to hear you talk because I really think back about what what I see um, here in the U.S. at a city level or county level or even state level, and it's really disturbing. And and you know, you talk about um, a need for a, a civic cultural revolution. But before we get into that, um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about what creates a toxic culture. And um, you know, I. It's interesting because you mentioned that it's difficult for what kind, you asked what kind of woman or anybody of the LGBTQ plus or LGBTQI plus community would want to step into this governance. And what I'm watching now in, in a number of cities that I work with and also some of my own experiences within our state is that 
we're using the right language and then the behind the scenes is ugly. And so, you know, I watched this video of really horrific behavior. And on one hand, I'm like, well, at least it's honest, you know, <laughs> you know what it's dealing with because it's upfront, you know? And, and at one point I was talking with one of the, the assemblymen in our state. And I said, you know, I feel like I spend more time going after people to like behave properly. Yeah. And, and that's what I spend more time doing than working on legislation. And he literally burst out laughing. And he said, Lisa, if you're gonna stay in, in the arena of governance and politics, you're gonna have to let go of that because you will never succeed, succeed and you will be eaten alive. And I was like, wow, okay. You know, and, and I think that this is something that we see in a lot of arenas. Um, I would call that uh, that person's impression a cognitive distortion. They they're so accustomed to thinking that that's the way. Aristotle has this uh, quote where he says that people who know not of the past um, can't visualize a different future. Like he doesn't understand that politics can be different. And furthermore, it now that we have data, but you don't even have to have data. But now that we have data and an ability to actually measure culture. Um, you can actually tell the degree of cultural entropy that exists in any type of system, any type of board or local government organization, or even community. And cultural entropy recognizes the, the extent to which energy is wasted in the system. So if your board or council faces a 47% cultural entropy score, that means half of the energy people are investing is completely wasted. And at a time like this, when our organizations, when our institutions, when our country, when our globe is under so many pressures that we need to collaborate and cooperate together and resolve complex problems like you know, climate change, how do we deal with the growing infrastructure deficit that affects us all? Those assets belong to the people. And if we're not able to sustain the infrastructure, then we have declining levels of service delivery, which reduces our quality of life, which reduces our ability to, to you know, our, our collective well-being. So these are issues of huge public importance and not just someone's impression because the way they've done it that way before that it's okay. It's absolutely not okay. And in fact, it was identified uh, very early on, like the ancient Greeks actually had an expression for this and knew very well about the um, sort of deceptive psychological warfare that goes on that's not as obvious as what we saw there at the Hartford um, Parish Council, but they called it like toxicon pharmacon. And toxic, the very word toxic comes from their word for arrow. And pharmacon is what you do is you put the poison on top of the arrow so that when it reaches its target, it is absolutely lethal. Because an uh, arrow might not, it might just hurt you, but the poison is like a slow poison and it slowly infects the entire system. Um, and and this, is, um, this is what's happening with that kind of um, toxicity. So yeah, what we saw in that video, we saw some yelling, we saw eye rolling, we saw um, you know, some abuse of power, we saw people very angry, very reactive, um, but we didn't see you know, some of the other du duplicitous kind of behavior that we see that actually can't be corrected with that. Like, how do you correct, for instance, corruption? How do you correct unethical action in a, in a workplace? The only way to correct, you can go after it legislatively, but it's too difficult to catch. The ultimate solution for that is an ethical culture um, that kind of shores everyone up and steers them in, in, in the right sort of direction. And so, um, so part of that process is becoming very clear on what really is, because we deceive ourselves and into thinking that some things are okay or not okay. And when I first you know, began this journey advising um, organizations and communities on fostering appropriate culture, the very first thing I did was I um, established these two mugs and I actually brought those so I'd be able to show you because one is the values of love, justice, leadership, trust, you know, kindness, hope, servitude, connection, empathy. It says drink for sustainable culture. And then the other one is the opposite, fear, anger, injustice, gossip, blame, backstabbing, domination, harassment, mocking, you know, and when you, when you put these out on a council table or when you put them in an office workplace, nobody's going to dare drink from this cup. But in a more honest moment, they'll admit to you that people are drinking from this cup every day, all the time. And, you know, like Plato says, 
um, a community is, the city state is what it is because the people are what they are. He believed that the, the, the leadership of a community is a reflection of the values of the people. And, and it's so, and that shows you the systems understanding that they had of these things. And toxic culture breaches trust. It creates unsafe, stressful environments that waste human capacity, waste resources, and really is our collective responsibility to address. And when we think about it, like these same civic leaders go home after, and they, you know, not to mention that they weren't able to make any effective decisions in that meeting, which I think was around 90 minutes in the end, um, but they remain in an afflictive mind state of anger, of resentment, of stress, of uh, frustration that filters through the community, further division, us versus them. And, um, and it forms a kind of uh, cultural poisoning, a trauma. And then you have people constantly reacting to each other. So it, the negative ramifications are absolutely huge and uh, much must be addressed. And one of the ways that um, I start in the book is to explain to people the first step in that is to, is to have the kind of discussion that we're having here to say, hey, okay, um, like save your city is you are here. This is the roadmap. We're all on this journey from, you know, Bullyville to Sustainable. Where exactly are you on that? Maybe your community doesn't look like that. Maybe the school, you know, there's a, a particular problem of bullying in the school. Maybe it's in your, um, you know, in your workplace. Um, but wherever it is, it's our collective responsibility to address it. And, and it begins by assessing where our culture is. And I actually make the argument that toxic culture is fundamentally anti-democratic um, and, uh, and that assessing our culture begins with understanding that toxic culture is, is authoritarian in nature, that it cultivates an appetite of might is right, you know, us versus them. And it forms the very thing that we've always talked about historically as being the greatest threat to democracy, which is the tyranny of the majority. Like why have a democracy if, if you're gonna be tyrannized by your neighbors? You might as well stick with a mediocre king, right? And this was, in order to fully realize democracy, we need to have what the ancient Greeks called eudaimonia, that spirit of goodwill to each other. Like during the ancient, during the golden age of Athens, um, the great statesman Pericles was so proud because at that time, every city state was allowed to have its own different governance structure. So it was like this great lab for all the uh, philosophers that were studying how to do things best, you know? And he would show off that the reason why Athenians can be democratic is because of that love, that goodwill, that brotherly, we are our brother's keeper. We don't even need the laws to be enforced. We enforce them ourselves, you know? And because that's what, that's what keeps because we don't have a ruler. We are both, you know, right now you're, you're the ruler, I am the rule because you're elected and I'm not, but tomorrow that may change. Any one of us can be put in a position of governance. So we all have to be capable of thinking in terms of the common good. And, we, and, and if we don't have a sense of goodwill towards our neighbor, if we don't think about their best interests ahead of our own, if there is not um, the effort to foster trust and to build a just society, then we are just sliding backwards towards something closer uh, like Bullyville. And those are, it's the difference between essentially a fear-based community and a love-based community. And for those who are not in local government, who are not studying it, all you have to do is listen to your heart. Ask yourself, do I feel fear? And should I feel fear? And to what degree? And, and wherever that's happening, you'll see all the same negative, reactive, authoritarian kind of impulses coming out that cause that same kind of entropy um, that you were describing. So I just want to take a second. I'm going to inter interject something here. We do have a few questions, both in the Q&A and also um, in the chat. And so I, I don't, before we jump into that, I want to hear a little bit more. So I'm going to like ha maybe have it that we hold the Q&A a little bit till the end. Is that, does that work for you? Or do you want to go them as we go along? That sounds great. I'm thinking if we do have that many questions, I, um, I know you would ask me to select a reading. I, I'll, I'll kind of gauge it. Maybe I'll just summarize it instead of actually read it. Okay, terrific, because I just want to respond to what you're saying, you know, about the toxicity and, um, you know, I, I uh, painfully, I will say, I love the image of, of a sword with, you know, poison 
on the end, because once one gets into governance, if you go in, as I did, like if you spend your life in the compassionate movement with people who are really committed to good and honesty and integrity and like a whole, it's almost like we really are, re are, are creating a different world in which we negotiate because of the higher level of emotional and social and cultural intelligences. And then you step into a local city council or county role or state role, the ways of um, relating are vastly different. I mean, I've been on council now for two and a half years and I am still learning how to navigate and really trying to maintain integrity. And I, I, I don't wanna put anybody's names out or anything like that, but I will say I, I had a fairly high up person say to me, Lisa, you're not playing this right. You're playing like somebody who really gives a hoot. And that's not what this is about. You need to go come up with a strategy. You need more voices and, and speaking up behind you and support of you. And the person was correct in what they were saying, but that's not how I generally play. And on top of that, what I've watched is how do I stay in integrity while this toxicity is coming towards me. And what has been most challenging is if I'm trying to speak about truth and honesty, and I know people are doing bad things and I wanna, do I show them to the public and help the, let the public know? Or do I just not and just keep going and holding a space of compassion and yet it, it comes back, you know, you're very vulnerable when you're choosing love, when you're choosing good. And I think that it, I, like as an, as an elected, I also look at, okay, part of my own languaging of identifying, I'm seeing parts of myself that I don't like. And it's not even like gossip, but it's, it's talking about somebody in a way that I'm not used to, to doing it. Like I usually look at people and see them as their positive potential because I know that that raises them up and that's from where I try to lead. But when everybody else is no down, you know, that poor languaging and kind of like that video we saw, it's really hard to build community and build leadership who are of this kind of mindset. Um, it's yeah. incredibly difficult and I actually feel your pain. And the, that's part of the challenge that there are no immediate solutions. Be, I mean, there's long-term solutions and you need to gauge it. So in some instances, if something obviously is criminal or it's causing someone harm, uh, either short-term or long-term, there are mechanisms and tools. It's kind of like, that's why we have harassment policies. That's why we have integrity commissioners. That's why we have ethics commissioners. Um, and they're slow processes, but they have to, you know, they have, they, have, they need, need to be pursued. But when it comes um, to staying true to your purpose, like, it's kind of like Martin Luther King, the example that he set, right? He continuously called people. It's like if you're going into a negotiation, you could choose to always bargain on the or politic on the basis of, of you know, power politics. But you could actually choose to, in every single instance, be like a Nelson Mandela and go in and argue the, 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 the common good, argue what is in our collective best interest. And sometimes you'll, you'll succeed and sometimes you won't. And some of it will be in your control. I'm sure you've seen this and some of it simply isn't. And, you know, Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, you know, he, he cherished Socrates and said what he brought to us was he taught us the ability to disagree without descending into quarreling. He literally spent all his days in the public square, you know, calling people. And how do you do it? By asking questions, asking questions, asking. And so that work that you're doing in compassion, that, that p internal peace work that you're doing, that that mindfulness, that centering. Sometimes you may feel, you know, wish that it could be more, but it is very powerful to go into a room the way you do with your own um, uh, good intentions and peaceful mindset and, and to not allow the real politic view of things to, you know, to pull you, to descend you into that um, kind of arena because you'd be surprised how many people, it's, it's a question of critical mass. In, the University of Pennsylvania has actually done a study to try and assess um, when can you actually, when does culture change actually happen? You know, when can you transform the ideas of a community or a group? And they found that 
it's when 25% of a group are, it's kind of like critical mass, 25% of a group are willing to stand behind doing things a different way. And so if you're entirely isolated, you know, I often advise people sometimes if you are completely isolated in a terribly toxic environment and there's like executive sponsorship, get out because you could get actually hurt. It's like going to, you may love the hyena, but you do not go hug it, you know? We can deal with like, and so um, there, you know, live to fight another day, as they say, find another way. And I've seen people like you, you know, passionate people do this. They'll, they'll try, they'll, they'll run for council. And then the next day they'll, they'll, they'll apply for the CEO job. And the next day they'll, like, if you love your community, there's so many ways. It could be working in a local library, right? And, and so, um, and just not to get frustrated that what you're doing is actually the right thing and moving forward with compassion is, is slow, but who do we remember at the end of the day and what do we remember Nero for, right? Um, and uh, what do we remember Nelson Mandela for? And, and I think there's a consciousness change happening now where we can see on a scale we couldn't before. We can actually measure the toxicity. We can measure the problems. We can see it in the cultural poisoning that's happening to all of us. The, the mental illness, the opioid crisis, the, the homelessness, the, the suffering that is now we've inherited everywhere. And I think that's creating the appetite. I think I remember, you know, this year you remind me, I remember uh, as a very young, in elementary school, they asked us the question, what's the point of manners? And I remember racking my brain thinking, I don't know. <laughs> And, and I couldn't explain it at the time. Maybe it's just a thing. Maybe it doesn't matter if you, and, and, and matters in and of themselves, manners in and of themselves for the sake of themselves are not important. It's only in the context of showing respect to your brothers and sisters, to the other, to your human family. And if it doesn't flow from the heart, it doesn't mean anything, but if it does, then it weaves that social fabric together, makes us stronger and makes us more resilient and makes us more capable of dealing with our collective challenges. You know, so in listening to you, I'm going to circle back to something you said earlier, and I want to go back to when we're talking about culture, you know, and, and the agreed upon behavior of social acceptability in light of manners. Um, in your book, you talk about um, four different types of cultural risk. Can we explore those a little bit? I think what I, oh, you may be referring to is the... Um, the spectrum of culture that I, well, that I, right, yes, right, yeah, right. That, yeah. And I speak about, um, like during COVID now, many of us would have had time to reflect on the nature of our relationships. I think we've been so busy. We haven't had that kind of uh, pause, you know, which for a long time, we've been talking about the decline of contemplation in society and what impact that has. Well, it makes it hard for us to assess the quality of our relationships. And I do talk about in the book that Harvard happiness study that found that what produces human happiness is not money. It's not power. It's not, well, it is uh, meaningful long-term relationships. And so in the same way that our, our personal relationships can exist on a spectrum from you know, no relationship like what we have with strangers to shallow relationships like we have with you know, uh, Facebook friends, let's say, or people who we do transactional relations with, shopping or whatever, um, to the sphere based to this love-based community, which is uh, what we're all heading to. And so, so this is the journey. This is the journey that I, that I take people on. And, and um, uh, and that's what the renaissance that you were going to ask me about is, is about. Yeah. So do you want to say more about that, about uh, uh, what the call for a civic values revolution or civic cultural renaissance? Or should sure. We so, so yeah, that's the second section of the book. They talk, it talks about the, the journey, um, join the renaissance. So this is like a call to action. Um, now that we know where we are, you know, how do we actually get there? And a renaissance historically is, is what it takes to get out of a dark age. And I actually got the idea because I knew there was a problem. And I read Jane Jacobs' Dark Age, dark age Ahead. And um, that was in 2004, like almost 20 years ago, she was this you know, great urbanist. And she was talking about how um, she's concerned that our cities, she's a Canadian and US um, urbanist, that our cities are on the brink of a cultural collapse. And, and she identified key pillars of democracy that are actually collapsing. Uh, one of them that she noticed was the household a, as a viable social and economic unit. So with households in the middle class collapsing and people being under so much pressure, this rising inequality, um, the typical role of the household is provide the nurturing, you know, social stability. When that collapses, then, you know, it, it creates a lot of pressure on, uh, on the, uh, you know, on the, on the city. She also points to a reduction of um, 
education into mere credentialism. And the ancient Greeks always talked about that, that you know, knowledge is something you could teach anyone. Wisdom is what education was for, so that you knew how to apply the knowledge, right? And this is what I think Jane Jacobs was getting at by saying that by turning, and even very much so in our local government sector, when you go for training, there is no course on civic values and character building and how to, you know, civic skills. It's mostly either charm school, which is like a quick little thing, and then a bunch of technical things on governance and laws and procedures and, uh, you know, things like that. So we've lost that sort of civic academy art of, um, art of education. And, and part of it is driven by the fact that we've turned citizens into consumers. So there was a market reason to not cultivate us and that's very different. Like a citizen just is there to rate, judge and consume products and then kick the vending machine or local government if they're not happy. Whereas a citizen is committed to the, to the common good and, uh, and has there's a lot of responsibility involved in citizenship. So all of that led to a lot of uh, fragmentation. And she talks about uh, a mass amnesia that characterizes the descent of societies from into into um, into a dark age where people literally step on infrastructure that and, and they no longer know what it is. So she gives the example of like, uh, um, you know, people in medieval times just, you know, taking apart aquifers and throwing them as stones, not realizing that that was that was delivering water services to all Roman citizens at one point, but they had no need for them when they're busy fighting each other. Right. And um, and she talks about how local governments were expunged by imperial decree one after another as they had faced governance collapse and were unable to meet the service needs of their populations. And I was just so alarmed because at the time, like, you know, in Australia, for instance, similar things are happening. There's been over a hundred local governments that have been expunged because they can no longer, you know, as they've implemented asset management practices, they found that th these governments are no longer sustainable. They cannot sustainably provide for the fundamental needs of their uh, of their people. And then we see the bankruptcies in the United States, we see, you know, in, in England, anywhere, uh, you know, in Canada, we have different financial sort of protections, but there's no question we have uh, municipalities under financial pressure and facing governance collapse. So that's not just a problem for, for you, local governments and people like me, it's a problem for all of us. And, and it involves, this renaissance involves a resurrection of our memories, like of, you know, there's this expression that people use today, memoricide, that we are facing a time when, like if you woke up tomorrow and you don't know where, who you are, what your name is, what your house is, and you don't remember, like how would you orient yourself in the world? So the book takes you on this renaissance back to classical history. And like, I, I, I definitely see we don't have time, but on, um, for those of you that have the citizen edition, it's the visions of Sustainable uh, on page um, 71. And then the local government edition, which is the one that has the workbook, it's on page 51. And it takes you through, you know, all the way back to, you know, St. Augustine's City of God's vision to um, the Pilgrim's Progress to Chief Nez Perez, making his claim at, you know, at Lincoln Hall to Martin Luther King. And forever, we, the democratic revolution has, is still seeking to be realized. We still haven't delivered on that promissory note. Um, however, we're still marching forward. And I was really encouraged when I saw like Amanda Gorman. I think she's part of the new renaissance. And in fact, I actually grabbed a copy of Time Magazine, which just came out, The Black Renaissance, right? And she talks about this. She says that in her, po in her inaugural poem, how democracy can be delayed, but it cannot be defeated. And um, I know like Alexis de Tocqueville, that um, French aristocrat who examined uh, culture in North America of local governments, he also said that ever since that idea was planted in the human heart, that we are all worthy of equal dignity, respect, uh, rights, freedom, and security, that it's an idea that will never die. And, and this is, in my mind, what the golden rule is all about. It's difficult to live up to that. Confucius called us to it, right? He was running around like me from municipality to municipality, like the Charter for Compassion, saying, you know, live according to the golden rule. And it, it wasn't realized during his lifetime. And we're still, you know, Martin Luther King's beloved community, uh, Krishna's call for civic leaders to follow the dharma and selfless action so this new renaissance is not just going to be a renaissance of classical antiquity roman and greek but it's going to include all the world's traditions and i think that you know if anyone hasn't heard uh, karen armstrong's uh, ted talk it's like so inspiring it's inspired everyone at the charter of compassion to make this global movement 
what it is. So um, that's that's the way. Uh, so that that's how we're actually going to get to sustainable and build the muscle to be there. Completely, completely agree. And you know, to your point, democracy is is actually a very um, difficult thing to create. It's not it's not this pie in the sky. And and not only you know you said in the book that we should be not just about one each vote count but each heart count. And when I think about the complexities of the heart and the complexities even of, of building compassionate communities, it requires cognitive thinking and critical thinking, mm -hmm. and but while still being engaged with the heart. So it really is a challenging task. Um, but my goodness, we're, we are already at 540 and there are a lot of questions here. So um, I'm gonna just kind of jump right in. Is that okay? Or do you, is there anything else you wanna I think I do want to just make one point because I think it's um, uh, so in the third part of the book, there's like the steps that we go through for, you know, fostering compassionate culture. And much of it is drawn again from the ancient wisdom traditions. And I just want to make sure I do raise that with folks because we talked about um, culture, about uh, choosing your values and choosing wisely because they have ripple effect consequences throughout your community and in everything you do. And so it really starts with knowing your values. And I wanna share that the ancient Greeks had thought deeply about this. And they had, the, the, the philosophers were like social scientists going around examining what, and they came up with four values. So I wanted to share that with everyone here. And the first one was exactly like what you were saying. They chose self-control, which in their mind was like self-awareness. It was um, self-management, self-regulation. Um, you can't have any other virtues if you don't have self-control, they said. It's kind of like emotional intelligence. And then the second one they chose was justice. And justice was important because um, uh, if you don't have a just city, like toxic culture is what creates injustice, people turning a blind eye to harmful actions towards others. And a measure of an ideal city was a just city. So that had to first be inhabited in the hearts of its people before it was gonna be in the life and conduct of the city. Then they chose wisdom, but they don't, it's not the wisdom that we know of. Like you think of philosophy, wisdom. They were talking about phronesis, which is a form of practical wisdom, which shows again their systems understanding that, um, that you don't just go into the world and do compassionate action, that you need to think um, in a systems way, how to have discernment to understand the causal purposes behind things and how your actions are going to ha have an effect in the broader community, long-term effect. So that was kind of the definition of practical wisdom that needs cultivation through civic academies. And then ultimately the cultivation of courage because without courage, they said, you can't possibly live up to these standards. Um, and and uh, Confucius also said this. He said that, you know, if you know the right and you choose not to do it, that is simply a matter of cowardice. And this is often the case. We actually in our hearts know often what is right. We have that kind of compass in us. And yet we override it because it's too difficult or we lack the skills or, um, or, or that kind of a thing, which is why this education that you're talking about, the social emotional learning, this, this renaissance of science around, um, around uh, uh, compassion and well-being that we see happening everywhere is so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. You know, you, you remind me um, to you've got this, the steps of, um, I'm just looking down at my notes, of fostering a compassionate culture. And I'm thinking, you know, how you talk about being in wisdom. And then you've got these different uh, five different steps. Um, can we do a quick run through of those and then jump to questions? Does that work? Sure. So they are in the third section for, for those that have it. Um, so the first key is to be intentional about culture. And that is like the moment of consciousness that we are personally responsible. That's like the crack where the light comes in, that no one's coming to save us. No one's going to fix your family culture, your community culture, your, you know, council culture. It, it depends on all of us and, um, and, and that we can make a difference. So that's, well, that's where that is at. And um, the next one is to assess culture risk, like what we actually just did, and measure for well-being. So this little experiment that we had of measuring the good of everything is based on growth domestic product, you know, is, I think there's a consensus arriving that that is no longer going to work for us. It's not going to work for humanity. It's not going to work for the planet. So there's that moving away from that and uh, a reminder, like Socrates says, what is the point of building 
city walls and battleships if the people protected by them and the people living in them are uh, building them are not happy are not flourishing from within and i think that's part of the exhaustion that we see that burnout that we see of you know local government officials feeling like why am i doing this when at the end of the day you know um so it's so that that's reminding us of our purpose and staying focused on that and then the next uh, piece is about forming civility circles or what you often hear people talk about. Uh, this is like our practice ground, psychological safety, circles of trust, brave spaces where we can speak truthfully and honestly and practice some of these civic skills. Um, and, and, uh, and then prioritize civic education in some way. So I think it's a bit of a, a long shot at this point to think we're gonna see nations launching huge new civic education campaigns. It did happen in the Nordic nations. There was the um, build on thing, but, uh, but there is so much we can do today with all the access to information. Civic, you know, most local governments can easily and without much cost turn themselves into peer to peer civic academies of, of learning. You know, there can be online training for, there is this wonderful program um, uh, by, uh, it's called Citizen Discourse. Um, and it's, they've just got this compassionate contract that people can sign, like it's a voluntary contract that people in the community can sign that commits them to these types of compassionate values and engagement in the civic square. And they also have a whole bunch of training on how to engage um, with civil discourse, but the key is developing the skills and the character. So those skills include skills and ethics, understanding ethics, ethical decision making, um, mindfulness, pro-social values like gratitude, um, you know, reconciliation, generosity, servant leadership, and and then the skills obviously are the ones that we talked about on how do we uh, positively engage in the public square, and then ultimately just you know loving your neighbor. So putting that into action collectively, and. Um, you know, I think that's exactly what the Charter for Compassion is doing. They're coming out, mobile, community groups are mobilizing and having a firm commitment from their civic politicians that they are going to be committed to um, compassion as an organizing principle. And there's been some remarkable, absolutely, if people haven't seen them, I encourage you to look at, you know, what's happened in San Antonio, Texas, in um, um, Pomona, California. There, there's just a mass kind of training going on throughout educational institutes, government institutes, and um, a, 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 re, a very conscious attempts to transform culture towards this love-based um, leadership, a transformational kind of um, culture that we, our hearts seek and desire. I, I think that that's really what the Compassionate Cities movement is really about, is choosing love and being um, just thoroughly dissatisfied with a system that is built upon repression and, and hierarchical behavior that doesn't encourage creativity. And this is one of the best things about the work that you're doing um, and the Compassionate Cities movement is doing. And, and for those who are not aware, the Compassionate Cities we and communities, we've got close to 500 cities and communities around the world. Um, and they're doing incredible work of transformation. So I think there is a global renaissance occurring here. Exactly. So um, there have been a couple- You're not alone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, I'm so tempted because like, I feel like we're just touching the iceberg. And in some of the conversations you and I have had prior to here, um, you know, we really got into real world practice and the theory and how to bridge that. So I hope this can be a conversation we can continue at another time. But I do want to get to people's questions. So um, there was one question that was asking, do we see a difference in behavior of um, what the the questioner uh, Donna Donna Mills was, was saying? Uh, how well, she always talks about how well do we adult and and adulting well and humaning well? And she her question was, do we see a split in more juvenile behavior versus more adulting behavior? From who? The the, the question are you asking? Yes. Um, is who from, Who's um, well, you know, there is the the values girl. Um, Actually, hold, on, hold on one second. She says, I think my comments and questions earlier refer to the values and ethics of love and compassion, our adult behaviors and values, whereas the bullying is more juvenile. Thank you for the clarification, Donna. Indeed. So um, the culture guru um, Richard Barrett has developed a um, 
it's basically like the Maslow hierarchy of needs plus a, a, an additional actualization piece that arrives at service and purpose. Um, and at the base foundational levels is where the cultural entropy exists. And it kind of represents our early development. Indeed, you know, if we're caught up in these kind of um, cancerous personal relationships, in obsessions with performance, in denying our individual passions, talents, gifts, and light and contributions that we can make to the world, self-actualizing, then yes, it is actually quite juvenile, but most people can rise out of it, but some don't. I mean, some stay stuck in that elementary stage and it need not be, it's a loss of human capacity. Yeah, yeah. So along the lines of separation, um, Marge Andre said, do you see a difference between male and female leaders? Uh, I, I can't divide it that way. I mean, we do have obviously a domination of men in leadership. So we see some of those bad be behaviors highlighted. Um, but I think that if we had to measure the human heart and our collective suffering and the tools and techniques that we use that are less than what is our best self, I think that probably both genders are not living up to, um, uh, you know, it's just possibly the case that in some, you know, men are getting away with it more or, or just seen more. Well, but if we haven't cultivated ethical cultures, I just find it very difficult to say that women are, you know, uh, I, think, I think we see amazing women leaders on the world stage and that's a place for us to place a lot of hope uh, because when given the opportunity, boy, are they shining lights. Yes, and I will comment to that from real world perspective. There are some of them are using the right language around inclusion and diversity and care and compassion, but the behind the scenes behavior in some ways, it's just as bad, if not worse than men. It's because they think that that's how they have to behave in order to get there. The other thing that is if a woman is strong, she gets labeled the B word and, and says she's domineering and just horrific. And so it's there, I, I do see in a local level a, a difference, not across the board, but it is there. In tactics, um, but not in heart, I would say. But fair enough, fair enough. Mm -hmm. So um, then um, Kathy Moore says, how do you measure cultural entropy? Uh, well, it's actually a, it's a survey that can be done and it only takes 15 minutes and you can go in, I do this in local governments. I actually, Kathy Moore is a mayor, so I, um, Kathy, I could come to your to your local government and do a survey, and uh, within a very short period of time, you'd know exactly where, in which departments, uh, on the board table, what the degree of cultural entropy. But it essentially exists in those foundational areas. So if there's resource scarcity or um, problems in relationships, blame, scapegoating, um, and uh, yes, I see. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Um, you can actually determine the exact degree and pinpoint it, which is great because then you can quickly address it. And most people when given the opportunity are, you know, there's currently a local government in British Columbia that's going through this transformation and they've, they've you know, received the report and have tackled it and have made dramatic change. It just makes culture change so much easier because most people don't wanna live that way, don't wanna work that way. And they need an opportunity and they need a guiding light um, and the political leadership and support to actually make that transformation. And that's why civic leadership is so incredibly important. Yeah. So um, I'm looking at the time. We have just a couple of minutes left and there are a number of additional questions. Um, and I, I, I think maybe we better begin to wind down a little bit, but there was one question in particular um, that asked where do we, you know, where's the best place to look for ideas to start shaping the conversation in your municipalities? Um, and I would say that there's a couple of places. One, you can go to the Charter for Compassion, Compassionate Communities and City Toolboxes, and that's one way. And then um, Diane does a, a lot of work in this area. And so I'll let Diane answer that as well. Um, well, I think uh, I also want the, the Charter for Compassion also has a number of uh, training programs that people could engage in to make transformation. And I know we're going to talk uh, shortly after about this, specifically this um, compassion integrity training for civic leaders that I offer. And in addition, through the Charter, I'll be offering a course later in the fall called Fostering Compassionate Community Culture. 
and it's a four part course that anyone could participate in and it will be set at charter for compassion rates like super accessible for anyone that is, affordability is not a barrier so um you know i invite people to join in there but again there's a renaissance going on uh online in communities um and if you're you know a ted talks form a conversation. I don't know exactly this person's situation, but even within workplaces, over lunch, put on a provocative, thought-provoking, you know, a TED talk on, on, on any topic that is, you know, kind of burning in your, in your workplace or community and see what happens. I think most people enjoy an opportunity to talk about these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th these, there are, th th we, looks like we have time maybe for one more question, and this came earlier in the evening. So, um, this is from Jess Woodward, who says, do you see a connection between the degradation of the natural world and the degradation of the political landscape? Is today's politics toxicity reflecting the current breakdown and toxicity of the natural global environment? Completely. And I think this could have been predicted by anyone who was wise. I remember, I think it was Standing Bear who in the 1800s was watching our colonialists come in and just tear everything apart. And he just was you know, shaking his head and saying like, wow, you guys run around and call yourselves gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Um, you run around like wild bees seeking the very thing that is so close to your heart, which like he's, you know, he just money, money, money. Of course, it's a direct, when we drink from this cup, we will destroy everything, you know, including the natural environment. Um, and anyone wise would have known that from the get go. I don't know how it was allowed to continue for that long, but it is leadership and personal responsibility and decisions that we're all making that's going to turn that tide back. And this is part of the challenge with the cultural, with the um, climate change movement. It's, it's so frustrating because how do you make that cultural change? It's a, it's a whole lifestyle change. It's a whole way of thinking that's got to be different. And that's why we're talking about values because only through values can you make systemic change. Absolutely true. Okay, four more minutes. Diane, there's one more question. Let's see. This is uh, from Jamie Nicholas. How do you deal with the power differential between elected and citizens? How do you avoid powering over citizens when the system is set up to have acted with power and privilege and citizens aren't privy to all the information electeds have? Well, I can answer that. It's very frustrating. And the only way that the most comprehensive way that I come up with dealing with this is turning advocating for the citizens saying that we need to turn our local government into a civic academy. There has got to be educational resources. There's got to be maximum transparency. If we do not have a federal government or a provincial government that is going to provide that kind of foundational civic education, which should be happening in our elementary schools, in our high schools. I once had a tour when I was the city manager of a high school that came to work in my local government. And the the principal of the school did not know that the local government did anything other than do water sewer and collect taxes and and if you know if that's what's happening we're just we're not the wires are crossed you know and i know lisa in some of our informal discussions you were talking about that frustration too that the huge disconnect between the what happens at the local government and and people and the public understanding that has got to be bridged if we want to have a democracy if we want to move forward to our sustainable future and if we want to be resilient we have got to address that. And it shouldn't involve too many resources if we do it right. You know, I wanna just add quickly to that. Um, I think though, in order to, to change the power differential, there are a number of obstacles. A lot of them are legal and how cities have to run, et cetera. And also depending upon your state, your country, wherever, um, the laws of how much engagement with the public and in what context an elected person can have. But one of the best things, and I wish I had learned this was, go to your city, go to your city's website and learn when do they have uh, councillor meetings and when what are on the agendas and when do they meet and start listening and everything's so great now with Zoom, if assuming you have access to technology, which is a whole other issue and, and broad bandwidth about privilege and not, but I just want to say- I just wanted to throw in a quick point that's very important in this regard, the decline of media. Local media has declined by 40% in the past 20 years. It's a huge problem. I, the federal government in the United States States in England and Canada are trying to put some meager resources towards this. But as a society, we've got to address this because how many times as you elected officials have been there saying, you know, if we only had a good, um, you know, true, Donna Mills makes that point. Yes, true journalists who are empowered, who are courageous, who embody those civic values and understand that they're not just upholding their newspaper, but they're upholding democracy. 
right? And on the subject, so go to your local city, go to public meetings and speak in public comment and get your voice heard. Um, and with that, we're gonna just jump to- um, If people share... wanna have my email, they can have my email if they have outstanding questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually I think we covered them, but I think the information all is here. Um, do you wanna give us like, oops, hold on one second, I'm sorry. Uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm sorry, one second, our slides. I hit go from the beginning one second. Um, so Diana, there we go. There we go. Um, so you will be teaching the resilient civic leaders course, leadership course. Do you want to take two seconds and share about that? It's a quick thing. It incorporates both the civic skills and civic character. So it incorporates the uh, life universities, compassion, integrity training with a comprehensive civic education training. And uh, it involves mayors, uh, CAOs, senior staff, um, and all talking together about the very same issues that we're talking about today. That one's coming up. And then I think there was one more we were going to share the details. Yeah. So the first one there is, is the, you know, where you can go if you want to find out more information for that course. And the second one is just to keep your eye out for the fostering compassionate community culture. If you have citizens that want to engage, if you have people in your community who want to run for a local office, encourage them to take that fostering compassionate community culture course, because it is too difficult that when people arrive in government to start learning then about governance and democracy and what their responsibilities are, it's far easier if they know ahead of time um, uh, what their duties and responsibilities are. Absolutely. Okay, so this has been a wonderful, wonderful time together. I see Kate is here, so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I'm going to thank everyone for being with you with us. This time went far too quickly. Um, I uh, I'm very sorry that it, it did do that because I feel like we just touched the iceberg. So um, thank you, everyone. And it was great being with you. I agree. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you so much, Lisa. Have a great uh, rest of your day or evening, wherever you're joining us from. All right. Thanks, care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.